everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, I have a very special guest with me. I have Patty Utaro, who is the director of the Monroe County Library System. And she and I are going to be talking a little bit about our fall preview, which books we're looking forward to reading this fall, and what books you might be interested in getting your hands on. So, Patty, you are a very avid reader. You have a book blog in addition to your work as director of the entire library system. Um, tell me a little bit more about what you like to read on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, I, I've been a reader pretty much my entire life, and I've been writing a book blog since probably the late 90s. Um, and I, you know, I have, like most people, I have some favorite genres. I tend to um, stick to mysteries and suspense. Um, I do read some historical fiction. I'm also a big fan of children's books. Um, you know, I used to be in youth and children's services, um, did a lot of reading in my early days of books for kids and teens. Um, and I continue to do that. I, I really enjoy middle grade fiction, although there's a little bit of controversy with that these days that it's not very creative right now and um, not uh, producing uh, pretty, you know, very high quality material, but I disagree. I think there's some great um, authors writing fiction for children um, as well as for adults. Um, I, I, my tastes are a little eclectic um, I don't always stick to one genre, um, but there are a couple things that I don't like. I, I'm not a particular fan of hard science fiction or romance. That's interesting. Um, I never used to read romance, and now I've started to dabble a little bit. And yeah, science fiction, I very rarely read. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think the romance, the romance genre really seems to have exploded yeah. over the last few years. Um, you know, the, the whole meet cute trope is, mm -hmm. is really big. And the, um, uh, the proliferation of, of modern style romances is really something. All you have to do is walk into a bookstore and you'll be faced with, with that type of, of fiction everywhere you look. Right, and I think it is bringing a lot of newer mm -hmm. kind of people into the library, too. So yep. I find we're buying a lot more romance, and we have a, a romance section. Yeah. We have a romanticy yeah. tag now. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's not, it's not all Harlequin anymore, right? Oh, no, no, <laughs> for sure. But so, yeah, so I think you and I overlap a bit in the fact that I'm also yeah. a British kind of British mystery, yes. or def definitely yes. mystery and suspense. And um, I like a little magical realism, too. Yep, so. I would agree. So I, would, yeah, I think our reading tastes are very similar. There. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what you pick today. So, all right. All right. So my first one that I'm going to talk about is coming out. It's published October 8th, and it's called The Witches of El Paso by Luis Jaramillo. Haramia. I think I hope I'm saying that right. But um, I don't know when it comes to fall, for some reason, the witches draw me the witches kind of magic or, yeah. you yeah. know, time travel, I'm into all of it. But um, this one, the summary, a lawyer and her elderly great aunt use their supernatural gifts to find a lost child in this richly imagined and empowering story of motherhood, magic and legacy. So they compare it kind of to the Inheritance of Orquea Divina and oh, La Hacienda. Books. Yeah. So if you if you call to the witches, they will come. That's the tagline. So set in 1943, so a little bit of historical, um, a lot of sisters, some family connections. I also love like a good family story, family yeah. secrets. You know, yep. sign me up. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this one, it sounds like there's a present day and a, a historical. So that's another thing that I know some people are really drawn to is the dual timeline. I like it sometimes if it's done well, so I'll be very interested to see how this one is because there's a modern-day grandniece who is a legal aid um, practice and a mother, so how this is going to tie in with the more historical story um, will be interesting to me, but... Um, 
there's of course she's going to have some supernatural supernatural powers as well. So um, that is my first one that I'm looking forward to. Okay, boy, October eighth I think is a big publishing day this fall because several of mine come out that day too. But the first one that I wanted to talk about is one that I've been waiting for for a long time. Um, it combines two things that uh, the author and the topic that have fascinated me for, for years. Um, it's about Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. And Dyer Van Frank was one of the most influential books in my early reading days. And this is a uh, uh, fictionalization of the Frank family's days prior to going into hiding. And it's written by Alice Hoffman, oh. who is one of my absolute favorite authors. It's called When We Flew Away. I'll, I'll read you uh, a little bit of a description. Um, Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl has captivated and inspired readers for decades. Published posthumously by her bereaved father, Anne's journal, written while she and her family were in hiding during World War II, has become one of the central texts of the Jewish experience during the Holocaust, as well as a work of literary genius. In the midst of impossible danger, Anne, audacious, creative, and fearless, discovers who she truly is. With a wisdom far beyond her years, she will become a writer who will go on to change the world as we know it. Critically acclaimed author Alice Hoffman weaves a lyrical and heart-wrenching story of the way the world closes in on the Frank family from the moment the Nazis invade the Netherlands until they are forced into hiding, bringing Anne to bold and vivid life. And this was written in collaboration with the Anne Frank House. Oh, wow. So um, has their blessing. Um, and you know, as I said, Alice Hoffman is truly one of uh, our genius authors of our current generation. Um, she, you talked about magical realism. She does that mm -hmm. beautifully in so many of her books. We, most people know her from Practical Magic and that whole series. But uh, you know, one of my favorites of hers is the Museum of Extraordinary Things. Uh, where, you know, like like here, she's sort of fictionalized the the life of the Frank family prior to going into hiding and imagine what Anne was like as a girl, uh, as a girl not in hiding, right? right. Um, and I, I'm just, it, this comes out September 17th, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Oh, I, I can imagine. That one sounds fantastic. I also really like her. I, of course, I like The Practical Magic, you know, all of those. She also, did she write The Book of Longings, too? Yes. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. I, and the, I, dove, the Dove Keepers. Keepers, yeah. She, yeah, she, you know, she writes very unusual and your know, different things. You know, sometimes it's very modern. Sometimes it's historical. Uh, but her writing is just awesome. And she writes a lot. It's like women focused. So that's yeah. that's really yeah. Yeah. kind of what draws me in too. Yeah. So my next one is published October 1st, and it is called A Song to Drown Rivers, and it's by Anne Liang. Um, another thing I really enjoy is myth retellings. Um, I really liked one of my favorite books, I believe, of last year was Clytemnestra. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, this one, instead of being a Greek retelling is um, it's a story about China. So it's inspired by the legend of Ishi, one of the famous four beauties of ancient China. Um, mm. So it's kind of an epic historical fantasy about womanhood, war, sacrifice, and love against all odds. So I hope that it doesn't turn too much into a romantic thing and it focuses more on her role like in the community, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, this one, she's in an enemy palace. You know, she's having to fight off some of the king's advisors because she has this great beauty, which has become a curse as well as something that, you know, is benefiting her. Um, so yeah, court life, being unmasked as a traitor, kingdoms. I don't know. It kind of had it all for me. 
Um, but she's in the palace, the enemy palace, as a spy. So, yeah, sounds very interesting to me. Yeah. And yeah. this one, I believe I got an advanced copy of it. So I haven't read it yet. It just arrived. It was a Book of the Month Club <laughs> choice. So when I saw it was sometimes they release a book like ahead of time. Um, and my daughter and I always pick a book to read together. And this is the one we chose for the coming month. So um, I will have more to report when I actually read this yeah. one, which I'm going to be diving into quite soon. Great. So how about so my your next one? My next one uh, is published October 1st. And I'm a little ambivalent about this one. It's Revenge of the Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, the, the Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell was a very influential book early in my career as a library director. Um, it was everywhere. You know, everybody was reading this book and it was all about how to identify tipping points, right? Things mm -hmm. in your industry that is going to turn everything upside down. Um, and then he never wrote anything else. You know, he hasn't written anything since the tipping point and now um, this one, Revenge of the Tipping Point, Overstories, Super Spreaders, and the Rise of Social Engineering. You know, and think about what the world was like 10, 12 years ago when he wrote The Tipping Point. You know, social media, TikTok didn't exist, right? Social media was still fairly in its infancy. So my expectation is that he's going to cover a lot of that. Um, this is what um, he writes ab about, and or the publisher writes about, uh, through a series of riveting stories, Gladwell traces the rise of a new and troubling form of social engineering. He takes us to the streets of Los Angeles to meet the world's most successful bank robbers, rediscovers a forgotten television show from the 1970s that changed the world. I'm very curious as to what TV show that is. Oh yeah, definitely, me too. If it's the Brady Bunch, I'll be very disappointed. <laughs> uh, uh, visits the site of a historic experience, ex, its experiment on a tiny cul-de-sac in Northern California and offers an alternate history of the two of the biggest epidemics of our day, COVID and the opioid crisis. crisis. Revenge of the Tipping Point is Gladwell's most personal book yet with his characteristic mix of storytelling and social science he offers a guide to making sense of the contagions of the modern world. It's time we took tipping points seriously. So I'm, I, the tipping point got some pushback about a decade ago that it was very superficial and not well researched. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see what what happens here. You know, he's writing. I, my assumption is he's writing primarily about social media and social engineering through the internet and likely AI. Right. Uh, because what what other tipping point are libraries and actually the whole world looking at right now but AI? Mm -hmm. And if we're not, we should be. Um, so I'm curious about this one. I actually had... That one has his on my periphery list. And um, one of the things I wondered is, you know, the book that we read for the class that I I was in that you taught was the, so since you've been publicly shamed, the John yes. Ronson book, I thought that book was so interesting. And that really yeah. went into, and I, I wondered when I saw the description of the tip, you know, the revenge of the tipping point, I wondered if he was going to bring any of that into it because really lives are broken on, you know, a one run wrong move on social media and you can find yourself, you know, there were several of those stories where, you know, you lose your job, you lose everything. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's a, a silly comment on Twitter and that, in, in that particular book, the public shaming book, that one woman right. completely lost her, her life, right. lost her job, lost her family. Before, yeah, before know. her plane even landed in the other yeah. country, you know, yeah. it was all yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious to see what Gladwell comes up with. Yeah. In this. Well, I also have some nonfiction on my list. Um, as you know, I love one thing I love almost as much as reading is food. <laughs> and um, there are two very big food memoirs coming out this fall. Uh, Ina Garden, 
um, the Barefoot Contessa. Hers is publishing October 1st, and it's called Be Ready When the Luck Happens. And I have read several of her cookbooks. You know, she's a, a network, food network personality. She's on the Today Show. I mean, this woman has been everywhere. And I believe she started out like in a food market in either Long Island or Nantucket or something. Um, so I'm just kind of curious to see all the different twists and turns in her life and what led her to where she is, how she feels about the success that she has, um, if there's any special places she likes to eat or places to travel. I'd like to hear about that, too. Um, she's actually been married for a long time, so it will be interesting. Oh, specialty food in the Hamptons. I knew it was somewhere like that, like kind of rich people, you know. Um, but yeah, she's got cookbook from everything to, I know, Barefoot in Paris, you know, to everyday cooking, cooking for Jeffrey. So um, this one is really on my list, definitely. And then, oh gosh, what's his name? I didn't write it down, but um, the Italian guy. I'll think of it. But, uh, <laughs> oh, Stanley Tucci. Yes, oh, Stanley yes, Tucci. Stanley Tucci. He's also got one coming out, too. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to be reading a lot about food. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a cookbook, too, that I'm, I'm looking forward to that comes out in November. And it's Betty Crocker's Found Recipes. Mm -hmm. It's 100 vintage recipes from the Betty Crocker archive. And, I mean, I, gr I learned to bake using Betty Crocker. So I, I'm really curious to see what kind of vintage recipes they come up with in that book. Well, it's funny to me because looking at some of the trends, my mom subscribed to Southern Living. So, therefore, I, you know, I still do, even though I live here in New York. But um, some of the photo photographs and everything of food look kind of vintagey now. So that's really coming back. Yeah. And yeah. and just how you're, you know, what kind of things you would serve at, you know, my mom used to have bridge club and this and that. And there were all these social events that you fixed food for. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would love to see that book. That would be mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Especially if it had like, I still have some of my mom's cookbooks, like her yeah. old original books. And just the illustrations and everything are, are awesome. You know, the way the women are dressed, it's kind of like, I don't know, Mad, what was that show? Yeah, Mad, Mad Men. Yeah, you know, you got the 1950s housewife <laughs> yeah. and her pearls and, you know, yeah. Wally Cleaver's mother or Beaver Cleaver's <laughs> mother uh, outfit. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm losing track. Is it my turn or your turn? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll go. So here's, here's a thriller for us. Um, and there are several coming out, but one I'm looking forward to is Paula Hawkins. And it is called The Blue Hour. And this yep. one sounds like most people would know Paula Hawkins because she wrote the massive bestseller, The Girl on the Train, which was actually turned into a movie as well. But this one is set on an isolated Scottish island accessible to the mainland only 12 hours a day. So I'm thinking kind of Agatha Christie lock room type vibes for me. Um, mm. So a famous artist uh, who has a notoriously unfaithful husband disappeared after visiting her 20, 20 years ago. So a present day discovery that intimately connects three people and unveils a web of secrets and lies. So Yes, secrets, lies, locked room, <laughs> Scotland, you know. Um, it says it re recalls the very best of Shirley Jackson and Patricia Highsmith. So to wow. me, those are two big yeah. names to be thrown around in connection yep. to this book. And I sure hope it lives up to um, the hype that they're they're giving yep. it. So Yeah, there, and there's you, this was one of mine, too, that I was going to talk about. And when you talk about hype, Oh my gosh, I won a prize package that the publisher did um, through sh the Shelf Awareness Newsletter mm -hmm. for the Blue Hour. And I got a copy of the book, a very cozy sweatshirt, uh, artist kit, and a bunch of bookmarks, and postcards from that Scottish island. And, and it came in this box that was um, pre-printed with the cover of the book and other things about Paula Hawkins and looking at it, it was big 
and looked at him thinking, oh my goodness, this publisher is putting a ton of money into this book. And my daughter came over the same day that I brought it home and everything disappeared. Oh no. <laughs> so she took everything. So I can't I haven't read it. I can't tell you what what whether it's it's great or not, but um she seemed she said she loved it. So Okay. So you actually yeah. already have a copy of the book. Yeah, I got huh? a copy of the I got a print copy of the book in that package. Oh wow. So, yeah, you know yeah. what? It, digital digital receipt, you know, advanced copies are one thing, but it's it's so nice to get like yeah. a, a print copy, you know. Yeah. Do you do you get the shelf awareness newsletter? No, but I got to write that Should down. There because you can um, you can enter for uh, print print uh, uh, advanced reading copies for lots of things. I get a lot through there. Okay. So uh, uh, the it's print and digital. Um, but also great news source for anything book related. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, so my next one, and I think you might also have this on your list, comes out October 8th and is called The Stone Witch of Florence mm -hmm. by Anna Roschke. Um, I haven't read anything by this author before, but the description of this book really pulled me in. Um, also, because... This is an example of a trend I'm seeing, you probably are too, Claire, of these special edition first run prints. Oh, of, with the beautiful of, of one, edges. Yeah. It's a premium special edition hardcover, which features an exquisite gold foil jacket, stunning four color end papers designed for personal inscription and beautiful blue sprayed edges. Right. The book is becoming an art form again, which I love. Yes. Uh, but this is, uh, let's see, uh, 1348. As the Black Plague ravages Italy, Ginevra di Gasparo is summoned to Florence after nearly a decade of lonely exile. Ginevra has a gift. Harnessing the hidden powers of gemstones, she can heal the sick. But when word spread of her unusual ability, she was condemned as a witch and banished. Now the same men who expelled her are begging for her return. Ginevra obliges, assuming the city's leaders are finally ready to accept her unorthodox cures amid a pandemic. But upon arrival, she is tasked with a much different mission. She must use her collection of jewels to track down a ruthless thief who is ransacking Florence's churches for priceless relics, the city's only hope for protection. If she succeeds, succeeds She'll be a recognized physician and never accused of witchcraft again. So, yeah, so historical fiction. And but, it's a um, debut novel, too, which. It, yeah. It, okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's yeah. A, a lot of times. I, I don't know. I, I'm drawn to them because I feel like sometimes the debut yeah. novel is really <laughs> some of the best work, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 But this one just caught my attention. I love books by M.J. Rose. And she has a whole series that focuses on gemstones and the power of gemstones. So that always kind of kind of fascinates me. When I read about this, I thought, oh, I really got to get this one. Oh, wow. Yeah, that does so sound witches, good. Witches again, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. The witch theme. Got to have our witches for uh, the fall. Yeah. Um, my gosh. One other one I wanted to talk about, too, is are you a Louise Erdrich uh, fan? At all? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes, actually, but I haven't read. Uh, I haven't read anything by her in a while. Okay, because she's got a new one coming out October first. It's called The Mighty Red, um, and Louise Erdrich. She has a bookstore. She's also been a Pulitzer Prize winner, a National Book Award winner. She always features. She's, I believe, is she part Native American or total? I know she's. She's definitely part Native American. She might be 100%. But um, this one is set in Argus, North Dakota. And it's a collection of people that revolve around a fraught wedding. Um, so Gary Geist, a terrified young man, is set to inherit two farms, is desperate to marry Kismet Poe, an impulsive lapsed goth who can't read her future but seems to resolve his. So this young woman, two people are in love with her, and, you know, 
violence and so forth is going to ensue, I believe, as to who gets her in the end. So it's um, it's got like some environmental themes to it as well as far as the farm. So it's, it's going to have a lot in it. And I found that her last book that talked about her kind of was based, I think, loosely on her grandfather. It was that way too. It's very long and it kind of meandered. I stuck with it and I liked it, but I'm kind of curious to see where this one takes her, whether it'll be something comparable to like a Barbara Kingsolver, you mm -hmm. know, which solidified kind of like the whole Appalachia region with Demon Kingsolver or how this one is going to go. It's called The Mighty Red by Louise Erdrich. So. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Um, my next one is called The Restaurant of Lost Recipes, and it comes out on October 8th. It's by Hisashi Kashiwai, um, and is a, is translated from the Japanese by Jesse Kirkwood. Um, I've been trying to broaden my reading more, um, reading more translations, mm -hmm. and um, I have found I really enjoy uh, Asian translations. One of my favorite books this year has been The Fox Wife by Yang Zi Chun. Oh, I love that one. Uh, it's wonderful. Yeah. And um, The Full Moon Cafe is one that came out this summer that was really interesting. But this one, and this goes back to our discussion about food, um, tucked away down a Kyoto back street lies the extraordinary Kamagawa Diner run by Chef Nagare and his daughter Koishi. The father-daughter duo have reinvented themselves as food detectives, offering a service that goes beyond cooking mouth-watering meals. Through their culinary sleuthing, they revive lost recipes and rekindle forgotten memories. From the Olympic swimmer who misses his estranged father's bento lunchbox, to the one-hit wonder pop star who remembers the tempura she ate to celebrate her only successful record, each customer leaves the diner forever changed, though not always in the way they expect. The Kamigawa Diner doesn't just serve meals. It's a door to the past through the miracle of delicious food. A uh, beloved bestseller in Japan, uh, it's a tender and healing novel for fans of Before the Coffee Gets Cold. Uh, this just sounded so soothing <laughs> to me. Well, uh, yeah, there's a couple of them, and and there, it's it's got that wonderful cozy feeling. Um, mm -hmm. I read one I think was called "Everything You You Need You Can Find at the Library" or something very similar to that. I'll look it up, but it was another one that was in translation, and um, and I really enjoyed that one as well, set in Japan. So, wow, nice. Yeah. I I have lost track. How many books have we talked about? Uh. We're over 20 now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think. <laughs> did you, you have <laughs> Did you have anything else that you're really uh that you're really looking forward to? Um the the other other the last one that I have that also comes out October 8th that I threw in because it's it I think it fits spooky spooky season really well mm -hmm. and it it represents another trend that I I've, I've noticed in the last few years is this this rise of the southern gothic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And horror novel. Um, this is This Cursed House by Del Sandine. This may be a debut as well. Um, yes, it is. Uh, in the Southern Gothic horror debut, a young black woman abandons her life in 1960s Chicago for a position with a mysterious family in New Orleans, only to discover the dark truth. They're under a curse and they think she, only she can break it. Um, that you know, that just really kind of grabbed me. It's got a great cover. I don't know if you can see it. Oh but, yeah, yeah, really, really great cover. But um, I've been finding them really enjoying these Southern Gothic horror stories that are coming out primarily from young black authors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when the Reckoning Comes by Latanya McQueen was one of my favorites a couple years ago, um, and this one just looks really fun. I'm also a big fan of Simone St. James, and this sounds a little bit like that, where you've got the mystery, the supernatural, um, but this one, this one sounds really creepy. So that does on my list for spooky season. That yeah, sounds good. 
That sounds really good. Yeah, I also love books that are set in the, hell, the South and have some kind of unusual. They always seem to have the really weird, quirky characters, too, along with the Gothic, which appeals yeah. to me greatly. So, but wow. So, thank you so much. We've got some great suggestions here. So, not just your typical like Pattersons and everything else coming out. Hopefully, we've given you some interesting things that you can enjoy this fall. And as always, I will try, I won't be able to put the links to the catalog in yet because many of these books aren't going to be published, but some of them may be in the catalog, you know, as prepubs, which um, I will link to that if possible. And um, at least you'll have the titles so you can get going on what you want to be reading this fall. But Patty, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real treat to talk to you and find out what you like to read and some of the things that you're looking forward to. Um, yeah, and, thanks for having me. Yeah, and you're definitely right. A lot of our taste overlap because now I've just added a whole bunch to my <laughs> yeah, to my list too. as well. Me too. So. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. We will, wait. We will see you next time. All right. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Patty. Bye, Sean. <laughs> Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean.